my honest to God first memory of anything is being on my father's shoulders uh, watching the RAC rally and his head was about that big. Neil wasn't born so I was less than three, about two and a half. I spent the whole day, didn't even have shoes on, my feet are in his jacket, he had a hood of his coat up around me, I remember his ginger hair in front of me eating sandwiches and I can genuinely remember that because when we ran, you know, you walk along the stage and then you have to get to the side before the next car comes and the whistles are blowing, we'd get back down and, and run to the next place. And so I can remember being kind of joggled around. I can remember we left, we left bread and, and, and coffee for Teddy Tar because there was, that was the only reason I'd go because there was, I had a little book and my mum my told me that this is where this bear from my book lives. So I went with him. So I can genuinely remember that was the very first, must have been 1970. The first car I can remember was a Mark I Cortina, uh, being in the back of that. And I remember that, and old green. Yeah, that's the first thing that I remember, but only not particularly vividly. The vivid memory was in the next car, which was a Mark I Escort, green, vinyl roof. Um, and it was actually sat in the boot um, with Ian uh, when my dad was uh, driving it around the local tip, going sideways. Uh, and he used to open the boot so we could see we could see all the, the smoke and all the all the gravel spitting out the back, and, and obviously cling on for dear life. So can we get uh, them locked up? Yeah, yeah, you probably <laughs> would these days. For me, um, it was the 308 Ferrari. Um, I used to uh, have my bed in a corner uh, with a lamp behind me so I could read Autosport most nights. Um, and then on the right hand side was where I had my, my posters of, of the car. Um, and I actually used to lie in bed with my head turned slightly so I could actually see the Ferrari when I actually fell asleep. Um, and it's amazing that when I actually sleep now in a, in a hotel or at home, I actually sleep with my head slightly to one side, almost as if I was looking up towards this poster. I don't think there was any one particular car for me. It was, uh, it was more a type of car. And I always liked, we used to go to Upton Park and at the front of the grid there'd be E-types and Aston Martins and at the back there's a little frog eye sprite. Somewhere about two thirds back there's Lotus. But there was always a kind of an Elan or something right a lot further forward than he should be. And it was always this David and Goliath and I always liked this little 1600cc engine competing against these four or five litres and the way the crowd got behind that car slipstreaming down the straight and he'd go through in the corner and then the, the fast car would come past on the straight and, um, that always excited me that and I like the, um, the elegance of doing that with small power and with a compact vehicle. It was probably the 288 GTO was the first time I felt real desire for a car. I saw one in the paddock at uh, Ulton Park and there was a copy of Autosport on the passenger seat and I just thought this guy is just, you know, that's heaven, you know, he's got the ultimate car, he's reading Autosport and he's come here for the day, you know. me there was a moment I think it was Brands Hatch 84 I think it was and I remember I was stood at um, Graham Hill Bend and Jonathan Palmer was in the Zack Speed uh, Formula One car at the time and I just couldn't work out why he was so much slower than um, a McLaren say or Ayrton Senna in the Lotus and that that interested me in terms of looking at the cars in the corner and and wondering how the suspension and the tyres were working with the downforce and the driver inputs and usually every question that you ask your dad as a kid he knows the answer to you know dad why do you do this and dad why do you do that and it was why is that car faster than that car um, and he couldn't answer that and so that was almost that can kind of almost fueled it fueled uh, an interest in um, in mechanics um, in vehicle dynamics, in suspension. You know, we come from pretty humble backgrounds, really, and of course, motorsport's always been expensive. Um, I think we were fortunate enough that our father took us to literally as many motorsport events as we physically could could get to. So, and being in the northwest, it was fantastic because we used to go. Obviously, the RAC Rally was based in Chester. Most of the stages were in uh, Wales. Um, my father had designed and built with our help a motorhome that kind of from a practical level and skills level was something which we learned from an early age of supporting him doing that so we used to get in the motorhome and go up and watch stages all over the country so certainly attending motorsport events was something we did and in a way um, it was it was good because it was always the dream it was always the dream to try and become involved in motorsport and if you knew my dad 
the level to which we attended events. I mean, this is unheard of. Um, the grandstand at Lodge at the time at, at Alton Park to stop people sitting on the handrail at the very back of the um, grandstand. It was a square section, but they'd put it in so it was like a, a diamond. So my dad made a seat with clamps that fit to the diamond with a footrest and everything. And it was like, like a little sofa for the two of us. And he set all the height that when he stood there leaning against the handrail, me and Neil are at the same height. And then he had the box with all the food in and you know, everything. If you go into a rally, he's got the ordnance survey maps. It's all been blown up the section we're going. He's measured how far it is to walk, compasses, all the rest of it. You know, is the, le the, le <laughs> the level he went to, to for, the, uh, for the attendance of these events. And I think Neil's right, that's where the, the desire to create things came from because he made everything in the house. He made sideboards, he made tables, kitchens. Even to this day, it still seems strange to come home and see dad watching television, doesn't it? Because normally he was in the garage welding, cutting, surf forming, you know, planing a bit of wood. He actually made me a, a wardrobe last weekend. <laughs> so <laughs> even though he's retired throughout our entire lifetime of 40 or 45 years, he's still tinkering and making things. I flew radio controlled aeroplanes and uh, so he built a shed in the back for me and it had a perfectly flat table so I could set up the incidence angle of my wings and everything and get it all perfect. So I think we got a lot of this uh, obsession with doing things right from him actually. Neil was always good at maths, physics, those kind of things. And it was, if you want to get into designing cars, it was, they only saw it as car engineering, actually. There was only one, it turned out there was only one course in the whole of the UK and only two in the world that you could actually study automotive design rather than automotive engineering. So I didn't even know it existed. So I loved cars, but I also loved design. And then I went on to study architecture because I just wanted to design things. And I just came across an article about the Coventry Design course in Car Magazine midway through my first year at architecture. What's this, you know? And there's all these images of, of guys sketching and stuff. I just I've got to do that. They said apply. I applied, got a place. Um, Use my A-level art folder for, <laughs> uh, for reference. No, that's, that's true, actually, because I had to obviously make sure that if I didn't get a place, I had to pass my first year exams. That's where the love of cars, the love of design all came together to car design. I used to come home at the weekends and work behind the bar at Alton Park. Um, and one night I was sat there and uh, my dad was saying, you know, what, what, what do you think you're gonna be doing after university? Have you, have you started to think of a career? And I said, well, I, I, no. Uh, and he said, well, what are you interested in and what are you good at? And I actually had a copy of Autosport on one side of me and Autocar on the other side of me. And my dad said, well, why don't you just design cars then? Because that's what you're interested in and you, 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 your skill set is, 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 is leaning towards it. So I, and it was really a eureka moment for me. There was an opportunity for me um, to work for um, a consultancy that was based on the south coast and they, do, they were doing a lot of work for Renault actually on, on concept vehicles, uh, composite structures etc which I found really interesting. There was an opportunity to go out to Germany working um, in Cologne at the product development centre there um, for Ford and um, it was working on the uh, Ford Mondeo. Each vehicle line always has what's called a drive team and, um, and I was exposed to being in that drive team and um, my ability to get in a car and appraise a car and say what was right about it and what was wrong, what was wrong with it or what could be improved was something that, that the team every single time picked up on. And so having been on the Mondeo drive team under Richard Parry Jones, I then was on the drive team for the Ford KA. And so that really was, was, was starting to tune me as a, as a sort of a chassis um, expert for want of a better word. And that coupled with a, like a race career that had started in go-karts. And that was really the, the base foundation for me for, for, for what we would later create with the Monoa here at VAC, obviously. So at that time, Neil was at Cologne, I was in Stuttgart. And uh, that's when I'd also, we, we, you know, we both found ourselves in a financial situation where we could start doing motorsports. So I was racing karting as well, but in Germany. It was a team run by a guy called Frank Yulinski. Um, he went all the way up to F2, raced against Jonathan Palmer around that, around that time. And he had a team of four drivers he'd put together to go and race in a 24 hour race at Le Mans. And we were driving through the night. And of course, this is a, he's a rock star, you know, to us. So I was kind of picking his brains about what, what's it like to drive. He's driven at Le Mans, he's driven F2, and he's driven NASCAR, he's driven everything. And I was just trying to ask him about how different cars are. And he said, if you're quick in a cart, you're quick in a formula car. They don't feel the same because one's a half a ton and one's 70 kilo, but the way they respond and the way your body instinctively reacts to how they respond 
it's, it's all the same bloodline. And at the time I was doing track days in a Lotus Elise, I was racing go-karts. And that was the moment, that journey, that, that nighttime drive, that was when I started thinking, I, I, want, a, I want a single seater. Uh, that, that's, that's, um, that's the goal. And uh, Neil and I talked about it. Neil found the idea really exciting as well. And uh, so we used to meet in Frankfurt and we did it, you know, once every couple of weeks and we'd have some sketches or some pitches or some ideas and things. And it was just a, a chance to sit together and go through it. And of course, back then it was, we didn't really know how we were going to get from A to B, but there was a desire. And that's where the desire really started. You look at it and you're obviously working on a vehicle that's as complex as a Mercedes or a Ford or whatever, and you think, well, actually, this car could be really simple. Um, and, and there's a chance that we could actually do this. After the work that I'd done on the Ford Focus, I was basically chief engineer on the Focus RS. And, and part and parcel of that being a um, Colin McRae and Carlos Sainz's rally car on the road was, was understanding what had gone into the world rally car. There was, there was the Focus RS project and at that particular time I was also racing so I'd, I'd just won a, a British Championship here in the UK um, which was a, a motorbike um, engined uh, category very similar to Radical um, and it, it's, it's very interesting although Ian had had a conversation with Frank Yelinski during his karting days about how different cars felt and how they drove I was feeling that on the racetrack so these cars had moderate amounts of downforce they were super light didn't have a great deal of power so it was all about momentum it was all about being smooth and it was all about chassis engineering and dynamics and making the most of the package that you've got but the, ne the next major step for me was to race V to V, um, which effectively is like an LMP3 series in Europe and race against some, some pretty serious who are in Formula One drivers now. Um, but they're very, very heavily reliant upon downforce. And from a driver's perspective, um, they weren't particularly fun to drive. Um, they were very physical. Um, the transition from grip to a slide was very, very aggressive. Um, and so you start to then learn about downforce in a car and how that could or couldn't work for, for this type of a project. It was through our practical experiences of, in our hobbies and racing and also in, in business that we were slowly but surely putting the building blocks together. We had no idea what it was gonna look like. We didn't know if it was gonna have cycle arches and be a kind of a tube, uh, whether it was gonna be full bodywork like a, a Le Mans car. I mean, it could, have, it could have at that stage, it could have become anything actually. The question then was, was obviously from an aesthetic perspective, what the influence was. And, um, and Ian and Ian and the guys went off in pretty much three different directions, really. It was a very, very sort of divergent um, approach. If it had have had an exposed chassis, it'd be like an Atom. If it had had full bodywork like a Le Mans, it'd be a baby Le Mans car. It didn't want it to be like anything. It deserved more than that. It's a new product. It's a clean sheet of paper design. This, this type of product's not existed before. So it should look like something from the future, not, not kind of trying to hark back to the past. So, it, you know, we wanted this kind of, something you might see in a Tron movie, you know, science fiction film, that kind of a thing. Uh, as a designer, I try to imagine how I'll feel when I see it. And once I'm clear how I should feel, then that's a kind of emotional checklist to recognise elements as you develop the vehicle that give you that feeling. And that's why the, the, the whole influences um, around it are important because, you know, a year into the project, it's be quite easy to kind of go off track. And so it's always important to look back and remember those images that gave you the right feeling. And, and are, are we there yet? And, and even, you know, things like um, the front, front headlights or uh, details that were never in the clay model that came really late on, the steering wheel and the, and the headlights and the rear lights and things like that. That was done in early 2010. So that was three years after we started. Neil and I were talking and with Murray and the guys um, talking about the headlights and our influence was this uh, Bjork video, which you probably know. Um, and if you look at it, you've got these organic surfaces, very thin, they don't create volumes, they only create surfaces. So they look light and beyond it, you see the mechanical elements. And so for us, it was that, that robot wouldn't have a recess with a light in it and a lens and all that. It just doesn't fit, you know. That robot, you would see all the little elements that control the light and you'd see the wires going in and you'd see a very simple machined part which would, light would come from. And so even three years later, that initial influence was steering the, the way the solutions um, were forming around the car. Because anything can look cool, it's how relevant it is to, to, to the product and actually what we're about. And so the minute someone saw for the first time 
our, our racewear that we've developed, um, they said, wow, you know, it looks like a stormtrooper. And for us, that was job done because that was almost the, you know, the stormtrooper was, was, was the sort of, you know, Bjork video of the, of the, of the 80s or 70s, 80s for us. It was Ian's uh, reference that stuck in my head was that the car should represent car design uh, and, and, uh, of, 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 of the 21st century, but look equally at home at a racetrack in a race environment with other race cars on a, on a track there as an example. It represents the future of possible race car design, but also when you see it on the road, that it, it doesn't look too out of place, that it represents supercar design of the future. And I think getting that, striking that balance was, was ultimately the, 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 one of the biggest achievements in terms of the way the car looks. This idea that it's a, a single seater, you know, given that we closed it and closed the front wheels, um, we still wanted to make the point that it is still only a single seater. And so this whole idea of what we later call it the core, it's just that there's a, there's a man shaped core to the vehicle inside there that I can see past. It shows me that all the bodywork is lightweight. I see the structure, but, the I then, yeah, structure. but then I see this, 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 this core in the center of the vehicle, which is the mass of the vehicle. I like the way the Formula 3000 cars looked in the, you remember when they had open engines at the yeah. rear? And I've always kind of liked this idea of something at the front, you know, doing its function of getting through the, through the air. And, and as that function becomes less relevant towards the rear, there's just less of it. So like on the motorbike, a modern superbike, you look from the front, you see mostly fairing. And as you look at the vehicle from the front to the rear, there's a transition as the aero function becomes less relevant and you see more of the machine. And that was also something we wanted to capture in mono. And also the fact that we've gone to what's clearly the most optimized solution of a longitudinal engine, longitudinal gearbox. Um, that gives a very elegant, thin rear end. And so we wanted to make a point of that in its design language as well. So showing those elements um, and then the whole bodywork culminating in that rear. And it was very important for us from an attribute perspective that all the attributes were in harmony. So how the car looked, how the car performed um, was very, very important. And, and, and my challenge or my team's challenge was to make sure that the car drove as well as it looked. Um, we didn't want to have a scenario where you're in your overalls and helmet and you're driving down the motorway at 130 miles an hour. And, in uh, Germany. In Germany. <laughs> and, uh, and someone's passing you in a Golf diesel on the Autobahn. So for us, it was important that the car um, had a supercar credible top speed. And that's why um, a lot of the work was done on the aerodynamics was to, was to make the car aerodynamically efficient and reduce the drag. Do you ever remember the Evo magazine cover that, that the guys did yes. for my birthday? Yeah. For my birthday in April 2008, they did a cover of Evo magazine and they put the, one of the final sketches of Mono that was going to go on the wall as we started to do the clay model. And you'll see it's very close to what we ended up with. Um, it said something like, because uh, um, my daughter had just been born as well, Mia. So the car at that time was known as Mono Mia, because um, we felt it kind of needed to be a double barrel name for some reason, but that, we dropped the Mia part eventually. But uh, Mamma Mia, it's the Mono Mia, a single seater supercar puts the competition to shame, something like that. We didn't write it, someone wrote it as a birthday present. But um, little did we know four years later that Steve Sutcliffe would say in his end of year review in 2011, it makes me get shivers when, even I, when I think of it. Even, even the Lamborghini, even the Lamborghini Aventador Avantado. was shaded by the extraordinary BAC mono. Yeah. And Evo, uh, the, the editor Nick Trott said, no car collection in the world is complete from today without a BAC mono. And so you do get goosebumps when you read those things because although it was done in a light-hearted way back in 2008, um, it was what we were aspiring to, to just do something that would, you know, kind of a game changer. And uh, the culmination of that really was, was effectively a concept um, showing of the car in March 2011 at the Retro Classic show in Germany. And it was, it was the same weekend as Geneva. And we kind of thought, well, we'd take the car there and you know, there'd probably be a couple of, couple of friends would come and have a look at the car and contact some people who we know. It'd be a little bit off the radar, really. Um, and it was just an absolute explosion. Um, Ian managed to work with the show organisers to have a, um, to have a VI, to have the car at the VIP opening on the press day, and there was about fifteen hundred people. I thought there was only going to be sort of fifty friends and family that would turn up, and there was like fifteen hundred people. Um, Ian was stood there, and we'd had all these forms printed because you know the sort of preparation. You know, that our father instilled into us, have all these customer forms and have everything ready if people are going to come and talk about the car. And Ian came over and he was kind of smirking and smiling. 
got this guy who wants to buy a car. And he, <laughs> he kind of couldn't really hide his excitement, really, of, of Christ, you know, someone actually wants to buy the car, you know. Literally, it's this guy's interested and he's interested and this guy's from the press in Germany and he's from Switzerland, he's from Austria. And slowly but surely, it was this, this sudden realisation of, God, this, this thing has really arrived now. And we thought it was going to be off the radar, but it was anything other than off the radar. It's, it's always a bit of a worry when you develop something behind closed doors for such a long period of time. You'd never really know how people are going to respond. If someone walks up to it, you don't have an opportunity to explain why or what it's for or anything like that. You just, they just walk up. And I remember these guys, had Neil and Guy had driven through the night from here to Stuttgart. I live there. So I'd gone on the plane the night before, got everything ready with the show. Designers. Phones have gone dead in the middle of- driving through the night. Phones have gone dead in the night. So I can't call them. They're in a truck which we'd owned for a few days. So I'm on pins through the whole night, wondering if they're gonna show up. Finally, um, the phone rings, we'll be there in half an hour, brilliant, they've made it. So we get up to the show and then it's cleaning the car, get it on the stand. Neil and the guys, you know, they've, all, they've just done an all nighter and they're cleaning the car. And literally as the, the doors open and the press come in, Neil and Guy are kind of exiting stage left, looking like death warmed up, you know. Um, and I'm stood there with my suit on and the very first guy, it was, a, it was a journalist and a photographer. And he got within about five meters of the car and he's nodding his head and he turned to his colleague, he said, this is what the crossbow should have been. And it was that moment, I get goosebumps now and I think of it, I thought, good, <laughs> we got it right, you know. You know, it, it, it always gets an incredible reception. Whether it's male or female, old or young, the first thing people do is take out their mobile, mobile phone and take a picture because everybody knows someone who's a car nut um, who they'll want to send the picture to or whatever. So that's been um, a real big highlight for me. And then of course, the number of people that have driven the car, whether it's journalists, customers um, or whatever, everyone gets out the car um, with a huge smile on their face. And that, that, that's a given but they always ha give the impression when they get out the car that they're almost a better driver than when they got in it and what that means what i mean by that is that the car they've they've pushed themselves to their limits they've maybe gone over them slightly but because, because the car's very benign the car's looked after them and that's not because of electronic aids it's just by its design and by the way that the car works they get out thinking god yes i can slide a car and i did feel like a racing driver i didn't just have the belts and the helmet on and sit in the middle and feel like a racing driver i actually drove like a racing driver and i push my limits and i feel that now i can perhaps get in it and go even faster again on the second time and of course that's very, very addictive in any sport or any or any activity if you do something and you feel like you're making progress whether it's tennis or snowboarding or skiing you feel like every single time you do it you're getting slightly better then you're going to want to do it even more and it's really addictive and i think that's the the underlying underlying thread with everyone who's, who's driven the car well because we had spoke about that it does have to work on a b-road and it does have to work on the track and i remember us even having that talk about a super bike saying modern super bike you could take it on a b-road and no other bike could keep up with it. You take it on a track and it'd be quick. They'd found that balance in a modern yeah. superbike. And I drove it um, in a street race in, in Poland called um, the Verva Street Race. It was the first time we'd ever driven the car, actually, uh, apart from the night before in a car park in the dark. Um, and, and I came in and they said, oh, you've gone quite quick there. But I didn't feel like I was. I didn't feel like it was going to do something to surprise me. The trust that it built, you, you have this feeling that the car looks after you because it tells you everything. It's not two tons of, of, of million pound supercar that you think, God, what's gonna happen when this thing starts sliding? It, 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 it's always communicating you that you don't feel frightened of it. But I have to remind myself to kind of enjoy it and, and, and to see the, the good side of it. It's not that there's a bad side of it, but there's a sense of we're climbing a mountain and I can see, I think I can see the top. And I thought the top was designing, deciding what this car is gonna look like. Um, and then as soon as you decide that, you realise there's actually, the ma it goes actually a bit further now because we've got to do class A surfacing, we've got to turn it into a real car. And then there was the, the moment you get it on a show stand, you th you'd think we're at the top of the hill kind of thing. But then that's the point when you realise this hill goes much, much further. We've got to turn this into a production car. We've got to create a car manufacturing business. I feel like every time you come over a little rise thinking this must be somewhere near the top now, Oh my God, it, it, it goes again. We've had the revolution of the car. That was, you know, blank sheet of paper and it's, wow, where did this come from? And now it's more about the evolution, really, of how we make the car even better. And there's, there's just some things that we've got coming through that if you think the car is, is, is fantastic now, then, then literally six months time, the next 12 months, there are some incredible things coming through that will make the car 
um, even faster, um, even more desirable from an aesthetic perspective, um, even lighter. Um, and all of that will just translate into, into a car that's even more special. We want the car to be the best it can be. I want it to be the best it can be today and I want it to be the best it can be in five years time. And uh, anything that saves us weight, anything that makes it perform better, anything that makes it a better product. But I think it's fair to say there'll always be a mono and, and mono will always be represented as it is today with, with that package and that, that layout. <laughs> I like, if anything, maybe too much detail and, and I particularly like this central spine area down here. It's really robotic, it's very graphical almost um, and it is a real epitome of the car and, and for me this, this, um, this brake light high up here uh, down the spine of the car um, is a fantastic idea. Um, I think it's fantastically executed and again the way how this, this area gets smaller and thinner um, I think that's a really, really nice detail and it gives the, the car a unique signature because of course these lights are normally typically mounted across the back of a car, um, typically in the headliner uh, and this is almost like the heartbeat of the car almost uh, and as I say it gives it a, a real unique signature as if you didn't know that it was a BAC mono uh, when you see it instantly, well you do when you see that particularly at night. We could have just raised the bodywork over the, over the airbox but everything starts to look bigger and heavier and more swollen. And, and again, back to motorcycles, you, you'd see a cam, a cam cover just poking through the side of a fairing. It shows that the, that the skin is pulled tight over the, over the machine. Um, you know, an athletic body uh, shows a bone um, and, and, and the, you have the feeling that the skin's tight over the muscle, you know, whereas an overweight uh, body is just kind of, you know, smooth, kind of sausagey shapes and so... And volume. And volume. And so I think that, that, uh, that's the reason we, we were happy to let elements stick through. And then here, this whole area, we've obviously got to get heat out. So all of this stepping here will get, allows us to have air gaps between all the panels. This is why this gap is bigger here than down here. So to let air out, there's a slot here. And then this whole rear area floats 10 millimeters away from what we call the spine. So that all lets heat out the slot here. That is actually the exhaust. And so that lets the heat out again here. So this kind of layering effect, it adds to the lightweight, it adds to the technical look, but it's all, there's a function behind it, which is to let, let the heat out. <laughs> You know, there was a time when car design was about creating volume and you created more volume at the rear to make it look muscular um, and you had your three box saloon and all these kind of, everyone talked about volumes and, and we went completely away from that. We wanted lightweight surfaces. I think something was perceived as good quality when it was solid. So a good quality kitchen work surface with a big, thick, solid granite top or solid oak or you'd knock it. Is that, is that? Is that solid? And, and that was a sense of quality because just more material meant it cost more money. And so that was a sense of it being valuable. But I think now the 21st century, the thinner, the lighter, if we build it with high tech materials, a, a really elegant table will be millimeters thick or, or the better your phone is, it's lighter, it's slimmer. And I think that whole kind of revolution inspired us um, and mono kind of epitomizes that that it doesn't try to pretend there's any volume it's all there that they're clearly shown as, as surfaces that hover above mechanical elements and I think that aesthetic probably did inspire some other designers I, I certainly hope so and you know I've had lots of conversations with other designers and I know that there's mono pictures up in lots of design studios but you know it's one of thousand things that influence those guys. I don't want to be too grand about this, but if Mono could become like a 911 insofar as the journey starts here and it's just, everyone knows what Mono stands for, they know what it's about and, and who buys it and what, how it's used, there will be a new Mono at some point. Don't know when it will be, but there will be one um, and we'd hope it would be a better vehicle as well. And, and within each new version, there'll always be a constant development to make it as good as it can be within that. <laughs>